Good evening to you all. Uh, tonight I have the opportunity to introduce uh, one of the most important Marxist and socialist feminist theoreticians, Liz Fogel. Uh, and when I say that, I am mostly referring to her most famous and uh, very influential book, Marxism and the Oppression of Women Towards a Unitary Theory. Uh, David McNally and Susan Ferguson uh, will say that Lise Fogel's book has lived largely an underground existence, but recently, somehow, publicly is quite recognizable and acclaimed. A part of Lise Fogel's lecture this evening will actually tackle the numerous subjects related to the book. Um, and actually, the book is published originally in 1983 and then republished in revised form in 2013. Liz Fogel was engaged in many civil rights and women, uh, women's liberation movements. She, uh, she was a professor of sociology at Ryder University and the author of many books and numer numerous articles. Before becoming a sociologist, she was um, engaged in earlier career in art history. Uh, the title of Liz Fogel's lecture tonight is Marxism and the Oppression of Women, in which she will discuss um, the historical, theoretical, political, and personal context of the original book, but also provide an overview of book's main arguments. So, Liz, the stage is all yours. Thank you. Um, well, I want to thank the organizers, especially Carolina, Carolina Ruga <laughs> and Ankitsa <laughs> for making it possible for me to be here at the conference. And again, the title of my talk is Marxism and the Oppression of Women, which is the title of the book that you just heard about, Marxism and the Oppression of Women Toward a Unitary Theory, published in 1983 by Rutgers University Press. 30 years after the initial publication, a new edition of the book came out uh, in hardback and then a year later in paperback from Haymarket, hooray. And uh, this new edition is prefaced by, well, everything you said. Uh, an excellent new introduction by Susan Ferguson and David McNally. I believe I've seen David McNally's name here, so he must have been here. Um, and they are academics located in Toronto, Canada. And it includes an additional article by me called the Beyond Domestic Labor, published in 2000, which I believe has been translated. Uh, the, the original book was intended as an intervention in then current debates among socialist feminists, especially in the United States. As indicated in the book's subtitle, my goal was to create a more unitary or integrated interpretation of the relationship between capitalism and women's oppression. The book did not get much of a reception in 1983. By the time it appeared, most of the social movements of the previous decades were in decline. The women's movement did survive, but mainly as a liberal feminist undertaking, increasingly internationalized and often co-opted. The effort to unite socialism, or Marxism, with feminism never entirely disappeared. But it dwindled to a very minor voice. A few positive reviews of the book were published in socialist journals. Translations began to appear, starting with a pirated edition in Turkey in 1990, which I'm told was very influential in the development of their women's movement. Translations began to appear. Oh, I said that. Um, in 2009, a Chinese translation came out, and Turkish and German translations of the new edition are currently underway. 
So a few words about the historical, political, and personal context of the original book. Although published in 1983, the book was a product of the 1970s. As you know, and some of you may remember, the, uh, the 1960s and early 1970s was a time of social ferment. Movements around the world were raising questions of justice, liberation, and revolution. In particular, movements for the liberation of women appeared in virtually every country. Beginning in North America, this so-called second wave of militant feminism spread quickly. English-speaking countries and the nations of Europe reacted first to the North American stimulus, but a new feminist consciousness emerged as well elsewhere. Although reminiscent of earlier feminisms, the women's movement of the 1960s and 1970s constituted a specific response to new social conditions. Not the least of their peculiarities was the, extension, was the existence of a significant trend known as socialist feminism, or sometimes Marxist feminism, which sought to merge the two traditions so self-consciously linked together. The, the emergence of a socialist feminist trend in the late 1960s was an extremely important development. Socialist feminism stood in solidarity with anti-imperialist and progressive struggles both at home and abroad. Simultaneously, it placed itself in opposition to a growing radical feminist tendency that considered male supremacy to be the the root of women's oppression and the main obstacle to female liberation. By the mid-1970s, however, the socialist feminist movement began to lose some of its momentum and bearings. The theoretical and organizational perspective of radical feminism now appeared to offer more guidance than they had before. Some socialist feminists became persuaded that Marxism could not be transformed or extended by means of the application of feminist insight. They suggested, moreover, that such a goal is not only unattainable, but betrays women's liberation to the demands of socialism. Whereas socialist feminism had originated in a commitment to the simultaneous achievement of women's liberation and socialist revolution, that double commitment now threatened to break apart. In short, the 1980s was not a propitious moment in which to publish a highly theoretical book about the relationship of Marxism and feminism. And now a word about the personal context. In the 1960s, I was actively involved in the civil rights movement and then participated in the women's liberation movement as it emerged. In many ways, it could be said that it emerged out of, out of the civil rights movement. I came to social movements already attuned by my upbringing to issues of class, race, justice, and liberation as well a little bit to issues of gender. In the rest of my talk, I will first provide an, inter an overview of how the original 1983 book intervened in the socialist feminist debates of the 1970s and early 1980s, and offered a new unitary interpretation of women's oppression using Marxist categories. Then I will try to delineate what the term social reproduction theory has come to mean over the past decade or so. In a way, it's as if a 21st century analytical framework developed out of my 20th century work. Finally, I will discuss how, in today's context, social reproduction theory is being used. So I begin, as I said before, uh, with an overview of my original 1983 text. The book, as I said before, 
was designed to intervene in the socialist feminist debates of the 1970s. For this per and early 80s. For this purpose, I divided the text into four parts. In part one, I traced the debate among socialist feminists trying to develop an adequate theory of women's oppression. Despite strengths, I argued, this work has been, had been constrained by insufficient attention to and grasp of Marxist theory. In retrospect, I can now see that the work was also hampered by an unwillingness to focus on class for several reasons, among which disappointment, excuse me, disappointment with the existing left's class-first analysis of the so-called women question. The left pretty much said everything will be solved after the revolution. Uh, and women were beginning to feel differently. And this was called a class-first analysis. Uh, and then per perhaps also we had a lingering anti-communism, especially in the United States, that resisted thinking in terms of class. That was the first part. In part two, I started my case for the usefulness of Marxist theory for developing a unitary theoretical framework that could encompass the problem of women's oppression. My method was to undertake a chronological reading of the classical texts of Marx and Engels. In this reading, I cast my net wide, looking for, for concepts I thought might pertain to the issue of women's liberation, and noting omissions and contradictions. In part three, I continued this survey of classical socialist texts, finding that the theoretical writings from the Second International sometimes exacerbated the analytical confusion. It was a, a mixed heritage. Both heritages, in a way, were mixed. Uh, in the final section, part four, I returned to the problem of developing a, a unitary theoretical framework. I began by recapitulating my contention that no stable theoretical foundation for consideration of the so-called woman question had been established by the efforts of either the classical Marxist tradition or the socialist feminist movement of the 1970s. Socialist feminists tended to favor a dual or triple systems perspective that suggested patriarchy and capitalism, and maybe also racism, were distinct or at least autonomous uh, systems. This dual systems approach was implicit as well in some of the classical socialist writings. I then argued that another approach, which I christened the social reproduction perspective, could locate women's oppression more directly within a Marxist understanding of the workings of capitalism. That is, it offered a unitary approach to analyzing women's oppression. In the rest of part four of the original book, I developed the social reproduction perspective. Using Marxist categories I had discussed earlier in part two, I proposed a theoretical approach that put childbearing and the oppression of women at the heart of every class mode of production. I then addressed the specific situation of women in capitalist society. Last but not least, I conjectured what woman's situation might be in some future society free of exploitation. My book constituted, it should be emphasized, a theoretical undertaking. It sought to place the problem of women's oppression in a theoretical context. Part four, in particular, presented what may appear to be a fairly abstract set of concepts and an anal analytical framework. This is as it should be. It is, in fact, the nature of theory. Only in the analysis of an actual situation will abstraction spring to life. 
for it is history that puts flesh on the bare bones of theory. I will return to this point, namely that theory is distinct from history in necessary ways below. Three decades later, my book is being interpreted in new ways. With respect to the old domestic labor debate, contemporary readers seem now to favor the social reproduction perspective over the dual systems perspective. And although I had spoken only of a social reproduction perspective, my work is being taken as a founding document of something called social reproduction theory, whose objects of study range well beyond the debates of the 1970s. So I ask myself, what is social reproduction theory? And why is it useful? That is, when people today say they are using a social reproduction framework or social reproduction analysis, what do they mean? Or what should they mean? So I sat down and I made a list, which uh, I don't consider final and it's, it's a provisional list of some aspects of social reproduction theory as I see it. And there are six items, six. First, it's a unitary framework. Social re reproduction theorists are committed to developing a unitary framework. That is, they assume that it is possible to extend Marxist theory to encompass gender and probably also race issues. No need to think of dual or multiple systems. That debate is settled from the point of view of social reproduction theory. Second, social reproduction theorists focus in particular on the reproduction of labor power in, in class societies. Marx had both a lot to say on this topic and not enough. One comment has become famous. Quote, this is from Marx, the maintenance and reproduction of the working class is and must ever be a necessary condition to the reproduction of capital. That's good. It's at the heart of capital. And then he goes on to say, but the capitalist may safely leave its fulfillment to the laborer's instincts of self-preservation and of propagation. So it's empty. Whatever Marx really thought, he provided no detailed analysis of the reproduction of labor power. From the point of view of social reproduction theory, however, the reproduction of labor power is a process or a set of processes that must be examined. In the words of Sue Ferguson, an important proponent of social reproduction theory, quote, Capitalist accumulation requires human labor power, but does not produce it. There is no mechanism in the direct labor capital relation to ensure labor power's daily and generational renewal. Thus, capitalism finds ways to organize historically specific embodied subjects, differently gendered and racialized subjects, in and through hierarchically and oppressively structured institutions and practices, such as private households, welfare states, slavery, and global labor markets. So that's the second element I'm saying is part of social re re reproduction theory. Third, social reproduction theorists distinguish four kinds of processes that make up the reproduction of labor power in class societies. First, a variety of daily, in other words, this is spelling out what Marx called instincts of self-preservation and of propagation. First, a variety of daily activities that maintain direct producers and enable them to return to work. Second, Similar activities that maintain non-laboring members of subordinate classes, those who are too young, too old, or sick, 
or who themselves are involved in maintenance activities or out of the workforce for other reasons. Third, what I termed generational replacement processes. These are the processes that renew the labor force through the bearing and raising of new members of subordinate classes. Notice that this is the only one of these processes that requires a sex division of labor of at least minimal kind. If children are to be born, it is women who will carry and deliver them. And fourth, processes that draw new workers into the labor force from outside the boundaries of the current labor force. With these four kinds of processes disentangled, the concept of reproduction of labor power can be freed from normative assumptions concerning biological procreation in heterosexual family contexts. Although the reproduction of labor power in actual societies has usually involved child rearing within kin-based settings called families, it can be organized in other ways, at least for a period of time. The present set of laborers could be housed in dormitories, maintained collectively, worked to death, and then replaced by new workers brought from outside. These harsh conditions have actually been approximated many times through history. Gold mines in Roman Europe, I mean Roman Egypt, rubber plantations in French Indochina, and Nazi Arbeitslager all come to mind. More commonly, an existing labor force is replenished in two ways. First, by processes of general, generational re replacement, whereby workers bear children who grow up to become workers themselves. And second, by the entry of new workers into the labor force. These new workers may be previously non-working members of the labor force. They may also be immigrants. For example, individuals who had not previously participated at all may become involved in wage labor, as when wives entered the American labor market in the 1950s. People may enter the workforce sporadically, at harvest, for instance, or during economic crises. Immigrants can cross na national boundaries to enter a society's labor force. Persons may also be forcibly kidnapped transported far from home, and coerced into a new workforce, as was done for New World slave, excuse me, as was done for New World slave plantations. From the theoretical point of view, in other words, the reproduction of labor power is not invariably associated with private kin-based households, as the debates of the 1970s commonly assumed. In particular, it does not necessarily entail any or all of the following, heterosexuality, biological procreation, family forms, or generational replacement. Nonetheless, most class societies have institutionalized daily maintenance and generational replacement processes in a system of heterosexual family forms. That such arrangements are empirically so common probably reflects their advantages, contested and constantly renegotiated over the alternatives. This is now the, the fourth of the aspects of social reproduction theory. Social, the use of the social reproduction framework or theory helps to make the structure of the reproduction of labor power in particular situations visible. That is, thinking within its terms sensitizes one to key elements, potential contradictions, and long-term tendencies. And here I have a few examples. Childbearing. 
Childbearing and early childcare can diminish the contribution subordinate class women might make as direct producers and as participants in maintenance activities. From the perspective of dominant classes, therefore, childbearing is potentially costly. For pregnant women's labor might otherwise have formed part of surplus labor. At the same time, subordinate class childbearing replenishes the workforce and therefore, thereby do benefits dominant classes. There is a latent contradiction then between dominant classes' need to appropriate surplus labor and their requirements for labor power to perform it. Ordinarily, generational replacement provides the major part of a society's need for the repro reproduction of labor power. Here, this is another example. Here, a severe labor shortage caused by war, famine, or natural catastrophe would, would tend to exaggerate the contradictory pressures on women workers. <laughs> Depending on the historical situation, Either the role of the family as the site of generational reproduction or the importance of women's participation in surplus labor, or both might be emphasized. During a period in which the ruling classes need to maximize surplus labor overwhelms long-term contradiction considerations, all individuals in the exploited class might be mobilized into social into surplus production, causing severe dislocation in its institutions of family life and male dominance. Such was the case in industrializing England during the 19th century, and such it can be argued is again the case today. Awareness of these contradictions and tendencies also enables us to identify potential sites of struggle. Migrant workers may fight against their isolation from kin. Native-born workers may oppose the use of foreign labor. Women may refuse to stay home to bear and raise children. Men may oppose the participation of women in the labor force. Workers may support legislation banning child labor. Women and men may organize to defend the existing forms of their institutions of family life. In short, the processes of the reproduction of labor power in class societies ordinarily constitute uh, an important terrain of battle. And now I have two last um, aspects of social reproduction theory that are on a different wavelength. They're, they're basically methodological. Practitioners of social reproduction theory are, or should be, very rigorous in their use of theoretical categories. For example, we should be careful not to take certain concepts as having common sense meaning, meanings that need not be explained. Take the simple and apparently obvious term, family. Everybody knows what a family is. If, if you find yourself, wait, excuse me. In fact, there is no such thing as the family. In the first place, families have a class character. The working class family, the property owning family, etc. In other words, if you find yourself talking about the family without modification, something is probably wrong from the social reproduction perspective. If by family you mean a kin-based single, uh, if you mean a kin-based heterosexual household with at least two generations, again something is wrong. Better to specify what you mean which opens your readers to the exi or, and listeners to the existence of other forms, as I suggested previously. In particular, it makes it possible to talk coherently about transnational forms of family, family households that are created 
by the global labor market and have several sites, but it's one family, perhaps. And last in my list of aspects of social reproduction theory, practitioners of social reproduction theory are or should not be dogmatic in their interpretation of classic texts. Just because we believe Marx, Engels, and a bunch of others were, quote, great men and women, it doesn't mean everything they said or wrote was correct. We must not be afraid to acknowledge this. Here and there, they were wrong. Wrong by omission. They didn't talk about things we now want to know about. And also wrong in what they actually said. I view this list of six aspects of social reproduction theory as tentative. It's my way of trying to understand what people in the 21st century are making of my 1983 contribution to some earlier debates. I'm sure there is more to, st to say. All this may seem to be very abstract. That is often the main critique of my work. So let me say something about my understanding of what theory is. As I see it, Theory is a powerful but highly abstract enterprise and sharply different from history. In Althusser's word, words, the French philosopher, speaking about Marx's capital, he writes, do not look to capital, meaning the book, either for a book of concrete history or for a book of empirical political economy in the sense in which historians and economists understand these terms. Instead, find in it a book of theory analyzing the capitalist mode of production. In other words, the object of capital is a theoretical entity, the capitalist mode of production. And the object of history is the empirical world. So all those facts throughout capital, which makes it so much easier to read, the whole working day chapter, this enormous chapter, uh, is somehow part of a theoretical entity. From this perspective, theory is necessarily abstract, as well as severely constrained in its implications. It can point to key elements, tendencies, interactions, potential contradictions, and sources of struggle. But it cannot provide richly textured accounts of social life. Even less does it directly explain events, suggest strategies, or evaluate the prospects for political action. These are mat matters for a qualitatively distinct kind of inquiry one that examines the specifics of particular historical conjunctures in existing social formations. So there is no direct way to predict from theory onto concrete historical reality. To put it another way, this approach conceptualizes theory as a sort of lens, you know, a lens that you look through. By itself, the lens tells us little about the empirical specifics of a particular society at a particular moment. It is only by using the lens that observers can evaluate such specifics. It is only by using the lens that observers can evaluate such specifics and strategize for the future. Compared to theorizing, which I metaphorically likened to building the lens. Compared to theorizing, these tasks of empirical investigation and political analysis constitute work of a different, and I would argue, more challenging thought, sort. But having a good lens is indispensable. How are today's social reproduction adherents using the lens? What questions are they taking up? 
And here I, I have two examples. Um, Titi Bhattacharya uh, is, was interested in examining the so-called work-family conflict by class. Uh, she contrasts Yahoo CEO Marissa Meyer's solution of a fully staffed nursery next to her office, and you've probably read or seen uh, this woman talk about how she can have her work and her family at the same time. It isn't that hard. I just have a fully staffed nursery next door. Uh, but she doesn't let her workers do anything similar, such as work at home. Bhattacharya suggests that an understanding of capitalism as an integrated system where production is scaffolded by social reproduction can help us understand the significance of political struggles in either sphere and the necessity of uniting them. Sue Ferguson and David McNally look at global labor markets from the social reproduction perspective, noting the various way, quote, families are stretched over multiple transnational households. In their view, the deepening of a social reproduction analysis centered on the global labor market is vital to a robust analysis of working class formation today. These are just two examples of how researchers and activists can use the lens of social reproduction theory to analyze the world around them. Finally, I'm at my conclusion. What I have mainly tried to do in this talk is provide a path toward a stronger analytical framework for Marxist and Marxist feminist work. In particular, I have argued that social reproduction theory offers a lens that can be very helpful. The goal, of course, is radical social transformation, what some may still call revolution. There's lots of work to do. Thank you. Shall I come and sit there? Well, thank you very much uh, for the lecture. I was hoping that you will actually raise some of the points uh, that you that you opened during during the lecture. So um, I will uh, firstly take the opportunity and ask just two questions: one general and one maybe more theoretical. No, precisely methodological. And then I will invite you all to join us and to ask uh, to ask questions. So uh, the first question uh, I wanted to ask you is: After 32 years, um, <laughs> yes, when Marxism and Depression of, of Women was originally published, we are actually just starting to rediscover ex uh, to rediscover um, its up-to-date analysis. What I wanted to ask you: What were the reasons? according to your understanding, that the book has lived an underground experience. Uh, is it possible to draw a line and to connect it, it with um, the neoliberal tendency of uh, depolitization of the radical theory during the 80s? Is it possible maybe to, to say something like that? Why it wasn't successful? Yes. <laughs> well, as I think I tried to say, probably too quickly, uh, of course it was connected to that. The, uh, from my perspective, there was a lot of activism in the 60s. Even people who didn't participate were affected. And uh, we usually mark it at 90, 1973, the, the big oil crisis. Uh, and the attack of what we later called neoliberalism after that. People needed jobs. People came into the women's movement in particular who had never had the experience of activism. And so um, in the beginning, activism and what we called theorizing, you know, writing pamphlets and things and circulating them, were done by the same people. 
And then after the 70s, and particularly into the 80s, there was a bifurcation and people who ran like abortion clinics or women's health clinics, they remained active and the rest of us, or many of us, went into the academy, got jobs in the universities, which wasn't as hard as it is now. And, um, and above all, in my opinion, people without a background in mass activism wandered into feminism and made it a career. So I don't know. I think that, does that answer your question? Yes, actually. Well, I have some microphone, but only for myself. <laughs> Okay, yes, you actually did give me the answer and I, I, I couldn't agree with you more. And the, the other question which I wanted to ask you is um, um, related to some points that you raised in your lecture when you mentioned several times different categories such as race, class, gender and sexuality. Um, as we are all aware, there is a new trend in theory, uh, methodologically speaking, and it's called intersectionality. So I was wondering, maybe you can share with us your thoughts about it. Are there some problems with intersectionality? Well, this will take a little time because I actually prepared it. <laughs> How did I know that this question would be answered? Asked. Um, Well, there is this wild, at least in English-speaking contexts, a uh, kind of wild popularity of this term, which, which really does seem to solve a lot of problems. Because it, it all started, well, it started, it seems to have started in the 70s with a dual systems analyses in which you had class and what we then called sex, but now called gender. Um, as two systems, patriarchy and capitalism, whatever, that, that somehow ran the world. And we wanted to know more about that. And then we immediately, in the United States, uh, if not already, added race, because what could be more important? And um, so we had race, class, and gender as a kind of mantra, the, the so-called triple oppression. And then other people would say, well, what about sexuality, quite rightly? And what about ethnicity? And it began to seem like an, a laundry list, what I would call a laundry list. Um, and so in, depending on how you trace it, at a certain point, someone said, aha, let's call it intersectionality, because that I think they thought it was kind of a new term, but I, my feeling is that it was a way to cover this laundry list and, and give due consideration to everything. And the term, I feel, has a positive aspect. It is an attractive solution to this problem. Uh, people like it. It seems to represent things as they are, and it seems to include everyone and everything. But ultimately, I think it's not useful. I think it's theoretically incoherent. Um, first of all, what does it mean? Uh, does it mean that we are all slotted into various social positions at the same time? I think what sociologists call roles. Um, and I think it for a lot of people, that's what it means. For a lot of people, it's about identity. Not so much that we're in roles, but that we have different identities. Uh, or maybe it's both, in which case, how do they relate? Uh, there's no clarity. And so I, I think, in a way, people who, at the moment, people who are talking a lot about intersectionality don't know what they're talking about. There's apparently one textbook on intersectionality that talks only about identity. Seems not right. The history of the term goes back, as I already said, to, the, to the, that trilogy and before that in the 
30s in the United States at least, black communist women were writing essentially about race, class, and gender. I, don't, I, I haven't investigated it enough, but um, it was some version of the trilogy. So it's an old term. And ultimately, I think the term is descriptive, or we might say, using the categories that I used before, empirical. It describes things, which is very helpful. But it doesn't explain things. Theory explains things. Theory is the level at which you can find explanation. So we don't know how these various uh, categories intersect, what makes them intersect. They're also ridiculously big. Race, what, what in the world are we talking about? Is race, is Palestinian race the same as black African race with 400 years of chattel slavery? You know, I think, I think in, for me, it's, it's, it's more confusing than helpful. Thank you very much. And now we can invite you maybe to ask some questions. Uh, well, I just wanted to ask you about the concept of patriarchy, because I noticed that you, you don't use it, but you prefer some uh, gender oppression, for example, more than the term patriarchy. So I would like to know if there is uh, some reason for it. I mean, I believe there is some reason for it. <laughs> uh, because uh, the concept is very often used in feminist discussions, but uh, very often doesn't have any substance. It doesn't have any meaning uh, in the discussions. Uh, it is taken uh, for granted most often. Mm -hmm. So thank you. That, that would be my question. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Um, patriarchy is a term that suddenly appeared in the women's liberation literature simultaneously, I think, in either 1971 or 1973. And suddenly everybody was talking about patriarchy. Not me. Uh, but um, I, I somehow haven't really heard the term in a long time. I'm, I move in small circles, perhaps. But it seems to me it's another one of these terms that seems to, ex to, to, be, to explain a lot, but nobody knows what it means. It covers too much. It helps you to say, to, to cross different types of societies, class societies and non-class societies. It has historically been used to say that, um, oh, for example, Patriarchy predates capitalism. Therefore, it can't have been created by capitalism. Therefore, it's hopeless to be a Marxist feminist or something like that. And it is true that something like women's oppression predates capitalism. But I think it's a, a trans-historical term that covers so much that it's useless. So I don't know if that's satisfactory. And it also, historically, it started out being used, as I say, around 1971 before, no, that's not right. Um, it, it gradually became a term that one associated with radical feminists rather than socialist feminists. Although perhaps socialist feminists are still using it. And there was the other question on the left, yes? I think there was a question here, too. Somewhere, a woman in red. <laughs> Uh, well, first of all, I wanted to say that I read your book for a course held by Professor Chakardic, and... Uh, what, excuse me, what did you say? I have read your book for a course uh, held by Professor Chakardic at our university. And he's my student. Yeah. Ah. <laughs> so, and, oh, this uh, person. Yes, yes, and um, it's an honor to meet you in person. And my question is... Uh, 
Uh, regarding uh, domestic labor, what if a woman decides that she wants to be a housewife uh, and uh, uh, submissive in marriage, let's say, in that, let's say that, that way, and uh, if so, uh, is she then perpetuating the system of capitalism and patriarchy, uh, even though you don't like that work, the, but, uh, or uh, is she uh, an emancipated and free individual? Also, by the same logic, if a man chooses to work hard uh, is, she, is, is he also then perpetuating the system of capitalism uh, and so on? And uh, if you uh, suppose that my question presupposes methodological individualism, my question, my further question is, what case do you have to make against methodological individualism? Thank you. Uh, I don't think, let's see. <laughs> well, surely we believe in choice, right? So people should have the right, you know, you didn't, it, it was both very specific and very vague, what society are we talking about? But it certainly seems to me people should have the right to stay home and raise children if they want. Is that the wrong answer? <laughs> <laughs> and, and vice versa, I didn't mention any sexes or genders. Um, so, I mean, your question is at a wavelength that I don't understand, I think. So I'm having trouble with it. I think, I think if, you, if these questions derive from my book, I'm concerned. <laughs> <laughs> but if, if my book got you thinking, I'm pleased. I think um, nobody... It's not the way to think about these questions of, you know, life choices. Uh, am I perpetuating or something? I don't know. And I can't see you. I just see a little head up there. <laughs> uh, can you rephrase your question? Uh, well, um, to rephrase my question, the most important part about the question was the last part, uh, if uh, you have, I mean, do you have a case to make against methodological individualism? Like uh, when you said that we naturally assume that we have free choice, uh, can you explain that a little bit uh, more? Oh no, I said we should have great choice. And do you believe we do have free choice? No, of course not. We're constrained by, particularly now, I don't, I, I, if I were a, a different professor, I might say something not nice about methodological individualism. Well, okay, thanks. Are, are you assuming you have methodological individualism or you would like to get rid of it or? Uh, well, I, I'm neutral about You're neutral. this topic, yes. I just wanted to hear your opinion. Okay. <laughs> so. Well, and is, there was another question here. When we uh, talk about Marxist uh, feminism today, uh, I think my question is, uh, who is our audience? I think to be a Marxist feminist, you have to know the theory and the previous debates around, uh, around the, the, the women question. So I think liberal feminism in th this day and age offers quick solutions. Um, I think... Um, for the working class women, women and women, um, you need both time and ener energy to, you know, to get to know the theory. And when liberal feminism offers you the, you know, the questions and the concerns like equal pay or this lean-in feminism, it's much easier to, you know, uh, accept this sort of feminism, this type of feminism. And I guess my question is, um, you know, does Marxist feminism have a future in a world which has given up the revolution you were talking about in the lecture, I think, you know, for the, I think for the newer generations who haven't experienced socialism, um, we are constantly told that we live in a post-socialist world, so there is no socialism in the future. A good question. We're also told we, li we live in a post-feminist world. Um, I mean, that really is a good question. Um, 
I mean, it's not, uh, liberal fem feminism is appealing also because it's part of dominant ideology at this point, which it wasn't 30, 40, 50 years ago. Uh, and so, I think, I don't have a, a, an answer. I mean, I, I think the, the issue is we are living in very, very difficult times. And when some of these ideas eventually were being put, uh, created and or acted upon, there were large-scale labor movements, there were mass movements of other sorts, depending on which era we're talking about, and those things seem gone now. So of course it's uh, a bad time. It's a much better time, from my point of view, than it was 10 or 20 years ago. There is a lot of activity, a lot of activism. Uh, it's unclear where, if it's going to gain m momentum and become social movements f that will attempt change. Um, so I don't think it's a question of audience. I think it's a, a, a question of these ideas work in the context of movements for social change. And then the other thing I wanted to say is even, I mean, you, you expressed a kind of pessimism, which I think I share. I have long-term pe pessimism. I'm appalled at how strong capitalism is as a force. But on the local level, on the day-by-day -day level, people can can join groups or m engage in activities that improve people's lives and therefore are worth doing, even if they're not going to lead to the revolution some people would like. Well, thank you. I, I read some reviews of your, of your book, the second edition, and they were, um, well, I would say, two substantial uh, critique points. One was um, dealing with your treatment of Engels. Uh, they um, have written that you were too, too strong on Engels. Maybe can you tell us something about it? It's actually on the chapter Engels, a defective formulation maybe just a few words about it. And the second critique point was dealing with uh, maybe the problem that uh, a colleague Shushak uh, just mentioned, um, the problem of theory and abstract level. They usually say that your work is too abstract or that you are theoretically rigorous. Too rigorous, yes. <laughs> well, on angles, I, I, have, I made a series of mistakes I have now discovered uh, in that book because I, I love angles. <laughs> How can you not? Condition of the, what is the 1844 condition of the working class in England. Um, and, and he wrote beautiful things about the relations between men and women. You know, that when, uh, he went projecting the, the future of the family in the communist society. What that will be, only they will be able to decide, speaking of individual choice. Uh, so so he's, he's a wonderful guy, but I titled, <laughs> I titled the chapter in which I critiqued the origin of the species. Uh, I, I, I titled it a defective formulation because I indeed feel that that particular book um, is confused for several reasons which I tried to explain in the chapter. It has several different theoretical underpinnings, was written in like three months for reasons I conjecture were, were political and polemical. Um, so I've been questioned about this, and, and I apologize to those who also love Engels, but I think underneath this questioning, I'm not sure, is a kind of dogmatic approach to 
is possibly a dogmatic approach to classical texts, that since he wrote it, he can't be wrong. And I'm not sure that's true, but that's what I think might be going on. And I think we have to be able to free our minds from the dogmatism that is part of the legacy of the class. So, and then second about my theory to abstract. Yes, to read. I, I originally, I've been through a lot of lives. I originally majored in mathematics as an undergraduate. I wasn't good enough. So then I tried art history. Um, and then politics happened, and so then I switched to women's movement. But um, rigorous is good. You can't, I mean, I, I, I can't apologize for being rigorous. And the too rigorous part is, if, if it translated into too hard, we'll just keep trying, or, I don't know. I, I don't really have an answer. Okay. Some, something else? I have a bit provocative question, and I'm okay if you are not eager to answer it. I spoke about this uh, with Cindy Katz, uh, and I don't know if you know her, she's a Marxist geographer uh, and also feminist geographer from New York, that do you have also this feeling uh, sometimes that the Marxist theorist uh, in America, which is mostly the world kind of dominated by male Marxists, that they kind of uh, uh, disvalue the work of female first art Marxists and also the feminist Marxists. And the second question which related to that, we also had a few years ago some male Marxists here at this festival uh, making some comments about Angela Merkel as the uh, austerity symbol which were kind of on a feminine line of Angela Merkel, and how do you see that kind of uh, discourse used by some male Marxists? So can you repeat the other question concerning Angela Merkel? Yeah, it was, uh, it was a comment about Angela Merkel, uh, the fight against Angela Merkel, and this uh, argument also was not just on the side of Angela Merkel as the protagonist of austerity measures, but also on the fact that Angela Merkel is a woman. And this was an okay, okay. argument being made by some male Marxists, but without mentioning any names, of course. And what was Cindy Katz saying? Ask him again. What was Cindy Katz saying? You she asking my opinion of what she said. Do you also have this feeling that the, that the American Marxist uh, theorists are usually, it's a kind of a world dominated by male Marxists and that they disvalue the work of female and the feminist Marxists? I don't think they disvalue it. I don't think they understand it. They don't make an effort to understand it. They don't realize that there were thir there's 30 to 50 years of writings they would have to absorb in order to participate in our discussions. Um, so I guess I agree. I don't think it's just American male Marxists. I have a little comment about that in the short article that has been translated into Croatian. Um, it's very dis disheartening to see, you know, after all the changes in the world and all the work we did, to see older male Marxist economists as foolish as they are. And um, I don't know what to do about it. <laughs> but um, as I go around talking, it's, I see that um, it's full, you know, my audiences are full of young people, full of young men, and I, who are seriously interested in these problems and have done work on it. And I think that's wonderful. I don't, I guess I really can't believe the stubbornness of people of my generation and maybe a little bit after, but they just can't see it, is my impression. So that's that one question. Yes. And then I, I, I don't, I've never voiced this opinion. I've never been asked about it. I haven't, the Angela Merkel thing. I don't consider myself an expert in international politics and so forth. 
And I do know there are these little gestural things. Somebody stroked her back, bush, right? Uh, and, you know, nice little girl. Um, but I think she, she is who she seems to be, like Thatcher was who she was. And what was, the question is... The connection between her as a woman and uh, the stands of politics where she plays, because she has a position to do something as a woman. Does she? <laughs> well, I haven't, I, I, I'm agnostic because I obviously don't know enough about this question, but my sense, you know, my sense is she's not a feminist the way I am a feminist, and she seems to make her way in the world quite well. I don't know. I don't know. I don't understand the question. Yes. yes. We have two more hands. Carolina. And then Paula. Thank you. Um, when we we're talking about the uh, plurality and diversity of feminist movements um, and the problem of uh, finding uh, common ground, yesterday, for example, we had an LGBT uh, panel and they raised the same question, question of solidarity, finding a common ground. Um, how should we do that among women and the new generation of feminists? Do you have some suggestions? <laughs> um, this is not a theoretical question. <laughs> no, this is a practical yes. question. Yes. And I have a practical answer. But, um, so you're saying people are feeling very divided when they objectively should be united. They're all women for example, or all interested in the question of gender and so forth. Well, the, the traditional answer, I think, is stop writing position papers and act on some campaign together. Um, I don't know what form these divisions come out in. You know, it was sort of vague. But I mean, if it consists of agreeing on a three-point platform, so no, you don't have my fourth point, but if you add that fourth point, I won't go with you. Try to find a way to work on the issue rather than to argue over points. That's a, a traditional, I think that's a traditional left, piece, left answer. And what was the, oh, there was a second person with us. Uh, is it possible uh, by making uh, domestic labor paid for women to become even more limited to the private sphere of housework? Or in other words, um, is it possible that women are encouraged uh, to stick more to a certain type of, of labor, namely um, domestic labor? Again, this is, uh, this is a very abstract question outside of a particular context. And my, my gen I'll come back and answer it. My general argument uh, is that building the lens or thinking up theoretically and understanding that is hard, but it's easy compared to making historical analysis and political plans. That's much harder, it seems to me. And it's only the influence of professors in universities who want to be theorists, because theory is more illustrious. Um, but I think practical political analysis and historical analysis is much, it's much harder, full of many more details, et cetera. But anyway, so the question was, we're paying for domestic labor. And again, we're using a, a term that has a common sense meaning. We don't know what it is, et cetera, but we'll, 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 we'll let that go. It's not rigorous. We'll just agree we sort of know what domestic labor is. And that if it were paid, it might have a good effect or a negative effect. Um, I heard that in some country very recently domestic labor there's an, uh, an effort where is that Ecuador, Ecuador. Ecuador. <laughs> Ecuador. 
Yes, that's right. I heard that while I was traveling. I have no idea. I think it's very interesting. I couldn't take a position on it without knowing a lot more about Ecuador. But it's incredibly interesting. Because I, as I was told, they're going to uh, pay for domestic labor, meaning the unpaid labor of, of it doesn't have to be women, the unpaid labor of people who maintain the household. I don't know if it's only women. I don't know if it's only single parents. You know, it's, it's, it's not clear. And also pay domestic servants or give an extra support to them. It sounded very interesting. Thank you. And the last question goes to Rada. Since we had the pleasure to have you as our guest in the Center for Women's Studies, and since you also mentioned here that you are a um, steady pessimist, uh, but since your book has been republished 30 years later, means that there is an optimism in rereading the Marxist approach to the oppression of women. So tell us, as, as now from the position of an optimist, um, how do you see the uh, nice non-named marriage between Marxism and feminism in future relationship? Not, you know, like domestic labor not being said what is the content. So this marriage also is in a broader sense. So Marxism and feminism in future. Very nice question. I want to start, though, by finishing my answer to the domestic labor question. Another thing one would want to know in Ecuador is, you know, what the struggles are around that. Potentially, it could raise consciousness in good, progressive ways. So, so, the, so one would have to look at such a reform uh, from a lot of angles. Um, well, I'm certainly, I mean, I'm less than half a year ago, I, I started this little jumping around talking, and it's better each time, and I feel very optimistic about the people I'm meeting. Um, That's all I can say, and I, I thank you all. I mean, it, this has been really eye-opening to me to come to a small country, small former Yugoslavian, for small former socialist country, and find such a live discussion and so many interested people. It is marvelous, and uh, we'll see each other again, perhaps.